Hello, Peric. It's so good to see you again. Just last fall, you published Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. In this book, you describe a number of factors for human migration. In a historic context, what has been the role of food? That's a great question, Alain. It's great to see you again. And I really appreciate the way in which the Dutbala Institute has always viewed uh, these issues in an interdisciplinary way. And here you've just linked the issue of food with human migration. And that's absolutely essential because fundamentally both are geographical questions. We have taken for granted the physical location of food production and the physical location of our population distribution for many, many centuries. In fact, most of the human population lives uh, north of the equator and optimally between 20 and 30 degrees north latitude. But given climate change, we're seeing that the geographies of agricultural production are changing. In fact, instead of the traditional food production centers, we have a lot of drought and volatility in the United States, in Brazil, in Australia, in India, and China. And at the same time, we have new centers of food production like Canada and Russia. So we have a new geography of food production, and some of these new geographies are unpopulated areas. So we are seeing people moving away physically, migrating from drought-stricken regions, and potentially, eventually repopulating new agricultural zones of production. And so that linkage between food, agriculture, and migration is just starting to accelerate and become a very major issue for us to focus on in this century. For human migration, there seem to be push factors, such as hunger, and pull factors, such as more fertile grounds. When we look into the future, which one of those two categories will be more important? That's an excellent question. It's not necessarily about whether push or pull factors are more important, but they are, first of all, that they're both happening and they're both very powerful, but they play out at different time scales. The push factors can certainly be issues like the drought that I mentioned earlier. It could be political crises, uh, it could be a wide range of factors that are driving people away from their present geographies. Uh, in my work, I, I summarize it or I put them into these buckets, like political, economic, technological, climate, and so forth. The pull factors can be labor shortages, and it can be demand really for uh, a rectifying the imbalance in generations in northern countries. Because right now, as you know, in the OECD countries, there is a significant gap between old and young, or rather, there are so many old people, but fewer and fewer young people. But the politics has not allowed for the immigration of younger people to bridge those labor shortages. And those include agriculture, manufacturing, construction, all manner of industry, healthcare, medicine, information technology, transportation. In so many areas, we see that we have these labor shortages. And But the pull factor is driven, or the friction is in the politics of that. I do see that a number of countries have really changed their policies, like Canada, you can see it happening in Germany, even in Japan. And those happen to be countries that actually have a growing potential as food production centers, as do countries of Eastern Europe and Central Asia as well. How big would you consider the chance of us being able to feed the entire world population? Actually, it's interesting that right now the world population is very close to reaching its maximum point. I call that peak humanity. Many people used to believe that the world population would reach 14 or 15 billion people. In fact, Alain, it turns out that the world population will probably peak under 10 billion people. And the geographies of overpopulation are concentrated in certain African countries like Nigeria or Ethiopia, in certain Asian countries like India. But even in those countries, you are seeing the fertility level come down very rapidly. And so the world population will probably not reach 10 billion people. We can produce enough food for 10 billion people. We do produce enough food for 10 billion people, but we have, uh, again, a supply chain issue. We do have volatility in terms of climate change, of course, there's volatility in markets, uh, but we do know that it is logistically feasible 
to accomplish this necessary distribution. And importantly, it's not just about maintaining the far flung global food supply chains that we have in the past. Because as you know, those have also been a significant contributor to global warming because of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the agricultural supply chain. So if we not only strengthen our supply chains, but also strengthen local production capacity of staple goods and other kinds of crops and use technology, we will probably be able to not only produce enough food, but to produce more food closer to the geography of demand, the geography of people. You just mentioned technology. How important do you think novel food such as lab grown meat will become in the future? I think technology or food technology is a very exciting area. I've looked at hydroponic and aquaponic uh, food production uh, facilities that are really ramping up, especially during the pandemic, given the lessons that we've learned about uh, borders and supply chain disruptions uh, during the pandemic. And so countries have been accelerating their efforts to do uh, plant-based meat, cell-based meat, to do hydro and aquaponic food production. And this is, this is uh, available technology. Of course, it's less water dependent and consumes less water than traditional agriculture. And so its main impediment is actually electricity supply, which is also an issue that we're resolving through uh, renewable uh, and alternative energy sources. So I have a lot of uh, hope that this, this trend uh, in all of the investment, of course, that you know is going into it, is going to uh, have a significant payoff in terms of increasing the availability of various sources of uh, food. You're painting a very positive vision of the future. Now, when we look at TV series or movies, the predominant view of the future seems to be a rather dystopian one. What do we have to do to achieve a positive future and to prevent possible wars in food? I don't think that there's necessarily one dominant vision, although, of course, pop culture, you know, has a very powerful grip on our imagination. But that is just one scenario. And clearly, the trends and the investments that we have been talking about actually um, are happening right now. We are not inventing those. It's the hyper dystopian scenarios that we are actually making up uh, because, in fact, these investments are real. They're happening and they're working. That said, I also deal in scenarios. And this, what you might call the rosy future is ultimately only one scenario. And there are other scenarios where, uh, because we are overwhelmed by, the climate, by climate change and climate shifts and disruptions that we're not able to cope uh, with them and, and to maintain the productive capacity of uh, agricultural assets in developing countries. That is a scenario. And then you could have mass migrations resulting from that, starvation even, and so forth, state collapse, feudal conditions really, and indeed water wars, land grabs, and so forth. But the, this, this notion of land grabs and water wars is less a reality than the, than, than the efforts that countries are actually making, not to steal resources from others, but to increase their own local capacity. And that's the most important story. It is the most fundamental driver and it is actually real today. Perk, thank you so much for sharing all these interesting insights. Again, I'm very much looking forward to your keynote at our Food Innovation Conference on June 15th at the Gottlieb Dottweiler Institute. Thank you so much. Looking forward. Bye-bye.